Welcome to Come Follow Me Canadian Style. We're in the Book of Mormon, week 22, and we're covering Mosiah 25 to 28 today. Chapter 25. Remember last week, everybody's returned to the land of Zarahemla. All the people of Zenef, King Limhi and his group of people, and Alma and his group of people who had escaped the Lamanites have returned. Now all the people of Nephi were assembled together, and also all the people of Zarahemla, and they were gathered together into two bodies. And it came to pass that Mosiah did read and cause to be read the records of the people as they returned, the records of Zenith all the way down to Limhi, and also the records of Alma. Verse 7, And now when Mosiah had made an end of reading the records, his people who tarried in the land were struck with wonder and amazement. This is kind of like a roller coaster ride. Joy, then sorrow then raising their voices and giving thanks to God, and then being filled with pain and anguish as they hear these stories of what had happened over the last 80 years. Now, I want to do a quick Hebrew lesson, and you're going, what? And I want to talk about this word, melechizedek, and you're saying, Carl, I have no idea what that means. Well, yes, you do. In English, we would say melchizedek, and melechizedek, if we break it up, is King, Melech means king, and Tzedek means righteous. And so the king of righteousness was King Melchizedek. And the reason I wanted to tell you about that word is the Melech, the M-L-K. And you'll notice in the top right-hand corner here that they have vowel dots or points to tell you how to pronounce it. But in the original Hebrew, they wouldn't have had those vowel points. In fact, if you look at the bottom left-hand corner, I've removed them, and that MLK also stands for Mulek, and it just depends on how you pronounce it. Melek or Mulek, it's the same root word, but Mulek means little king. And the reason I told you all of that was because Mulek or the Mulekites were from the ruling tribe of Judah, and Nephi was from a very small tribe of Manasseh, part of the ten lost tribes that were taken north by Assyria except Lehi moved down to Jerusalem before that happened. And the interesting thing about that is in verse 13, all the people of Zarahemla were numbered with the Nephites, and this because the kingdom had been conferred upon none but those who were the descendants of Nephi. And so even though the Mulekites, the people of Zarahemla, were from the tribe of Judah, the kingly tribe, the ruling tribe, they were ruled by the descendants of Nephi from the tribe of Manasseh, the nothing tribe, and all the prophets and all the kings come from the tribe of Manasseh. Now, this is just me speaking. I see a little bit of cosmic justice here, because originally, if you remember Joseph, who was sold into Egypt, Manasseh was his oldest son, but the birthright was given to Ephraim, the younger son, because of the righteousness deal. But here we have the reverse happening where the Nephites were the very righteous people, and so they got to be both the group that was in charge of not just the government, but also the church. Remember back in Mosiah 21 when King Limhi and all his people were in bondage to the Lamanites, and then Ammon came and helped them to be released, they wanted to be baptized. And there wasn't anybody there authorized. Well, there was. Ammon was authorized to baptize, but he didn't feel worthy, so he declined the offer. And they promised that later they would talk about what happened. Well, it's later, and in verse 14, it came to pass that when Mosiah had made an end of speaking and reading to the people, he desired that Alma should speak to the people. I wonder if we were flies on the wall there, if Alma would have been a little bit surprised that the king, who was a seer, who was a revelator, then asked Alma to speak. But Alma does speak, and they're assembled together in large bodies, and he goes from one body to another, preaching unto the people repentance and faith. And in verse 16, he did exhort the people of Limhi, and all those who had been delivered out of bondage, that they should remember that it was the Lord that to deliver them. And it came to pass that after Alma had taught the people many things and had made an end of speaking to them, that King Limhi was desirous that he might be baptized, and all his people were desirous that they might be baptized also. So we have a completion of that circuit, a closing of that story where they're baptized. But the funny thing is, some of them probably remember wicked Alma, the wicked priest. And he's the one who baptizes them. Verse 19. And it came to pass that King Mosiah granted unto Alma that he might establish churches throughout all the land of Zarahemla. And he gave him power to ordain priests and teachers over every church. 
Now, this was done because there were so many people that they could not all be governed by one teacher. Neither could they all hear the word of God in one assembly. Therefore, they did assemble themselves together in different bodies being called churches. Now, I want to take a little moment here to talk about the word churches. We think of today a church as an edifice, a building. But anciently, they were an assembly of people, both in the Latin and the Greek. And even in the Hebrew, it means a group of people. So every church having their priests and their teachers and every priest preaching the word according as it was delivered to him by the mouth of Alma. Verse 22, and thus, notwithstanding there being many churches, they were all one church, yea, even the church of God. And for there was nothing preached in all the churches except it were repentance and faith in God. Chapter 26. Now it came to pass that many of the rising generation could not understand the words of King Benjamin. Remember, we talked about him several weeks ago in his powerful speech where everybody fell to the ground and were converted and wanted to be baptized. But the little children at the time he spake couldn't understand the words that he was speaking, and therefore they did not believe the traditions of their fathers. Now in verse 4, they would not be baptized. Initially they could not understand, but then they made a choice that they would not be baptized, neither would they join the church. And they were a separate people as to their faith, and remained so ever after, even in their carnal and sinful state, for they would not call upon the Lord their God. And now in the reign of Mosiah, they were not half so numerous as the people of God. But because of the dissensions among the brethren, they became more numerous. From Elder Eyring, no charge in the kingdom is more important than to build faith in youth. Each child in each generation chooses faith or disbelief. Faith is not an inheritance. It is a choice. Those who believed King Benjamin learned that. Many of their children chose later not to believe. The scriptures give us a reason for they would not call upon the Lord their God. Verse 6, For it came to pass that they did deceive many with their flattering words who were in the church and did cause them to commit many sins. Therefore it became expedient that those who committed sin that were in the church should be admonished by the church. And it came to pass that they were brought before the priests and delivered up unto the priests by the teachers. And the priests brought them before Alma, who was the high priest. From Ezra Taft Benson, Seeking the applause of the world, we like to be honored by the men the world honors. But therein lies the real danger. For oft times, in order to receive those honors, we must join forces with and follow those same devilish influences and policies which brought some of those men to the positions of prominence. Today, we are being plagued within by the flattery of prominent men in the world. Now, that was said in 1964, and I think it's only worse now. Verse 8, now King Mosiah had given Alma the authority over the church, and it came to pass that Alma did not know concerning them. I think he's talking about the wicked people. But there were many witnesses against them, yea, the people stood and testified of their iniquity in abundance. Now, there had not any such thing happened before in the church. Therefore, Alma was troubled in his spirit, and he caused that they should be brought before the king. He didn't feel like he could judge them, and so he took him to King Mosiah. But King Mosiah had already given him the authority over the church, and there had been this split between the state and the church. And so Alma goes and he prays about it. He's in deep prayer because he's very concerned that he might do the wrong thing. And then the Lord says in verse 19, Because thou hast inquired of me concerning the transgressor, thou art blessed. Thou art my servant, and I covenant with thee that thou shalt have eternal life. And thou shalt serve me and go forth in my name, and shall gather together my sheep. And he that will hear my voice shall be my sheep. And him shall you receive into the church, and him will I also receive. For behold, this is my church. Whosoever is baptized shall be baptized unto repentance, and whomsoever ye shall receive shall believe in my name, and him will I freely forgive. From Joseph Smith. After a person has faith in Christ, repents of his sin, and is baptized for the remission of his sins, and received the Holy Ghost, then let him continue to humble himself before God, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, and living by every word of God. And the Lord will soon say unto him, Son, thou shalt be exalted. When the Lord has thoroughly proved him, and finds that man is determined to serve him at all hazards, then the man will find his calling and election made sure. Then it will be his privilege to receive the other comforter, which the Lord hath promised the saints, as is recorded in the testimony of St. John. 
So I think it's really interesting that here's a man, Alma, who is the vilest of sinners, then repents, and eventually has his calling and election made sure. So that gives hope to all of us. Verse 22, For behold, this is my church. Whosoever is baptized shall be baptized unto repentance, and whomsoever ye shall receive shall believe in my name, and him will I freely forgive. For it is I that taketh upon me the sins of the world. For it is I that have created them, and it is I that granteth unto him that believeth unto the end a place at my right hand. For behold, in my name are they called, and if they know me, they shall come forth and shall have a place eternally at my right hand. Verse 29, Therefore I say unto you, Go, and whosoever transgresseth against me, him shall ye judge according to the sins which he has committed. And if he confess his sins before thee and me, and repenteth in the sincerity of his heart, him shall ye forgive, and I will forgive him also. Yea, and as oft as my people repent, will I forgive them their trespasses against me. And ye shall also forgive one another your trespasses. For verily I say unto you, that he that forgiveth not his neighbor's trespasses, when he saith that he repent, the same hath brought himself under condemnation. Now I say unto you, Go, and whosoever will not repent of his sins, the same shall not be numbered among my people. And this shall be observed from this time forward. And it came to pass, that when Alma had heard these words, he wrote them down, and that he might judge the people of the church according to the commandments of God. And it came to pass that Alma went and judged those that had been taken in iniquity according to the word of the Lord. So he writes this all down. So this might be the first handbook of instruction. And I think it's really interesting that the people in North America got the idea of the Christian church and the idea of the assembly of a group of people who believe in Jesus Christ and were baptized and received a remission of sins in an organized way that was split from the state. They received it first here in North America before it was brought 100, 150 years later by Christ to the ancient world. From Elder Oaks, church discipline encourages members to keep the commandments of God. Its mere existence stresses the seriousness and clarifies the meaning of the commandments of God. This is extremely important in an otherwise permissive society. The shepherd has a responsibility to protect the flock. And so the interesting thing here is that even though the Lord forgives and he will freely forgive us as many times as we go seriously before him and repent, there is still a church organization that has this responsibility to protect the flock. That responsibility may require him to deny the sinner the fellowship of the saints or even to sever his membership in the flock. As Jesus taught, if he repenteth not, he shall not be numbered among my people, that he may not destroy my people. For behold, I know my sheep, and they are numbered. And so that's the reason why, even though God forgives us, there is still the church organization there, and it's their responsibility to protect the members of the church. Chapter 27, verse 1. And now it came to pass that the persecutions which were inflicted on the church by the unbelievers became so great that the church began to murmur and to complain to their leaders concerning the matter. And they did complain to Alma, and Alma laid the case before their king, Mosiah, and Mosiah consulted with his priests. And it came to pass that King Mosiah sent a proclamation throughout the land round about that there should not any unbeliever persecute any of those who belong to the church of God. And there was a strict command throughout all the churches that there should be no persecutions among them, that there should be an equality among them, that they should let no pride nor haughtiness disturb their peace, that every man should esteem his neighbor as himself. I think this is why they were able to establish this organized church with a handbook of instructions in the new world because of this equality, because there was a freedom that didn't exist in the ancient lands. Verse 7, and the Lord did visit them and prosper them, and they became a large and wealthy people. Now, the sons of Mosiah were numbered among the unbelievers, and also one of the sons of Alma was numbered among them, he being called Alma after his father. Nevertheless, he became a very wicked and an idolatrous man, and he was a man of many words and did speak much flattery to the people. Therefore, he led many of the people to do after the manner of his iniquities. And I think this must have been really hard, not only for Mosiah and Alma, but for the people, because they had to go to their leaders and complain about their leaders' 
sons. Verse 9, And he became a great hinderment to the prosperity of the church of God, stealing away the hearts of the people, causing much dissension among the people, giving a chance for the enemy of God to exercise his power over them. And now it came to pass that while he was going about to destroy the church of God, for he did go about secretly with the sons of Mosiah, seeking to destroy the church and to lead astray the people of the Lord, contrary to the commandments of God or even the king. I think this is why they went about it secretly, because there was a law that you weren't supposed to persecute anybody, and they might have been treading a very fine line here. And you know the story. An angel comes to Alma and the four sons and rebukes them. Verse 14. And again the angel said, Behold, the Lord hath heard the prayers of his people, and also the prayers of his servant Alma, who is thy father. For he has prayed with much faith concerning thee, that thou mightst be brought to the knowledge of the truth. Therefore, for this purpose have I come to convince thee of the power and authority of God, and the prayers of his servants might be answered according to their faith. From Elder Holland, perhaps no anguish of the human spirit matches the anguish of a mother or father who fears for the soul of a child. But parents can never give up hoping or caring or believing. Surely they can never give up praying. At times, prayer may be the only course of action remaining, but it is the most powerful of them all. Verse 16, Now I say unto thee, Go and remember the captivity of thy fathers in the land of Helam and in the land of Nephi, and remember how great things he has done for them, for they were in bondage, and he has delivered them. And now I say unto thee, Alma, go thy way, and seek to destroy the church no more, that their prayers may be answered. And this, even if thou wilt of thyself, be cast off. Two things here. You remember we've talked about this before, that the most historic story that is often repeated is the exodus from Egypt and how they were saved from bondage. But now we have the story of Limhi and of Alma and how they're saved from bondage. And this story becomes their history, their understanding, their deliverance. And so the angel makes reference to it. It's very close to them. It happened in their immediate time frame. The other thing that's interesting is notice how the angel allows people to have agency. Even though Alma and the people in the church prayed for deliverance from Alma the Younger, from the king's sons, he allows them their agency. Because he says to them, you have your choice, even if thou wilt of thyself be cast off. But he's protecting the church. The Lord says, you can't destroy the church. You can destroy yourself, but not the church. And you remember the story, they bring him back to Alma's house. And I love this painting because it shows the mother so concerned. Here's her son unconscious, but the dad's like, yes. Verse 20, and they rehearsed unto his father all that had happened unto them. And his father rejoiced for he knew that it was the power of God. And he caused that a multitude should be gathered together that they might witness what the Lord had done for his son and also for all those that were with him. And he caused that the priests should assemble themselves together. They began to fast and to pray to the Lord their God that he would open the mouth of Alma, that he might speak, and also that his limbs might receive their strength, that the eyes of the people might be open to see and know of the goodness and glory of God. I think this is really cool here as well, because Alma, even though it must have been such an embarrassment for him that his kid was such a terrible drain on not only his family, but the whole church, he still gathered everybody together to give them an opportunity to learn how the Lord works. He asked them to pray with him and to fast with him for his son. This is a really humbling thing, I think. Eventually, the prayer and fasting works. And we find in verse 28, after Alma wakes up, that he describes what happened. Nevertheless, after waiting through much tribulation, repenting nigh unto death, the Lord in mercy hath seen fit to snatch me out of an everlasting burning, and I am born of God. And my soul hath been redeemed from the gall of bitterness and the bonds of iniquity. I was in the darkest abyss, but now behold the marvelous light of God. My soul was racked with eternal torment, but I am snatched and my soul is pain no more. I want to talk about this word snatched because it's not used very often. But the Lord really is ready at the very instant that we turn back to him to rush in and grab us, to snatch us, and to 
help us back on the right path. He's just waiting with bated breath to help us as soon as we make the decision to change. From Elder Holland, we learned that repentance is a very painful process. By his own admission, Alma said he wandered through much tribulation, repenting nigh unto death, that he was consumed with an everlasting burning. I was in the darkest abyss, he says. My soul was racked with eternal torment. For three seemingly endless days and nights, he was torn with the pains of a damned soul. Pain so real that he was physically incapacitated and spiritually terrorized by what appeared to be his ultimate fate. No one should think that the gift of forgiveness is fully realized without significant effort on the part of the forgiven. No one should be foolish enough to sin willingly or wantonly, thinking forgiveness is easily available. We learn that when repentance is complete, we are born again and leave behind forever the self we once were. Verse 32. Now it came to pass that Alma began from this time forward to teach the people. And those who were with Alma at the time the angel appeared unto them, traveling round about throughout all the land, publishing to all the people the things which they had heard and seen, and preaching the word of God in much tribulation, being greatly persecuted by those who were unbelievers, being smitten by many of them. So this is a great reversal. 34. And four of them were the sons of Mosiah, and their names were Ammon and Aaron and Omner and Himni. And these were the names of the sons of Mosiah. And they traveled throughout all the land of Zarahemla among all the people who were under the reign of King Mosiah, zealously striving to repair all the injuries which they had done to the church, confessing all their sins and publishing all the things which they had seen and explaining the prophecies and the scriptures to all who desired to hear them. Chapter 28. And it came to pass that after the sons of Mosiah had done all these things, they took a small number with them and returned to their father, the king, and desired of him that he would grant unto them that they might, with those whom they had selected, go up to the land of Nephi, that they might preach the things which they had heard, and that they might impart the word of God to their brethren, the Lamanites. Now, a couple of things here. A small number went with them. And we don't ever hear their names. I wonder if, and again, this is just me thinking, that this group that went with them might have been part of the group that they had taken away from the church and then had gone back and reclaimed. And it's interesting that after visiting all of the Nephites and doing as much repair work as they could there, they now wanted to go visit the Lamanites. Now, this would be very, very difficult. Imagine being a faithful Latter day Saint in Russia right now, and one of your sons is called on a mission, and you're all excited, you assemble together, and you open the mission call, and it says Ukraine. That's how Mosiah and Alma must have felt when their sons decided that they wanted to go to the Lamanites. Remember, they had tried before to help the Lamanites, and they were a bloodthirsty group of people who wanted nothing more than to kill the Nephites. Verse 2 that perhaps they might bring them to a knowledge of the Lord their God and convince them of the iniquity of their fathers, that perhaps they might cure them of their hatred towards the Nephites, that they might also be brought to rejoice in the Lord their God, that they might become friendly to one another, and that there should be no more contention in all the land which the Lord their God had given them. Verse 3, Now they were desirous that salvation should be declared to every creature, for they could not bear that any human should perish, yea, even the very thoughts that any soul should endure endless torment did cause them to quake and to tremble. They'd been there and done that. Verse 4, And thus did the Spirit of the Lord work upon them, for they were the very vilest of sinners. And the Lord saw fit in his infinite mercy to spare them. Nevertheless, they suffered much anguish of soul because of their iniquities, suffering much and fearing that they should be cast off forever. And it came to pass that they did plead with their father many days that he might go to the land of Nephi. And King Mosiah went up and inquired of the Lord, if he should let his sons go among the Lamanites to preach the word. And the Lord said unto him, Mosiah, let them go up, for many shall believe on their words, and they shall have eternal life. And I will deliver thy sons out of the hands of the Lamanites. What a relief that would have been to King Mosiah. Verse 10. Now King Mosiah had no one to confer the kingdom upon, for there was not any of his sons who would accept the kingdom. Therefore he took the records which were engraven upon the plates of brass, and also the plates of Nephi, and all the things which had been kept and preserved according to the commandments of God, and then caused to be written the records which were on the plates of gold, which had been found by the people of Limhi, 
which were delivered to him by the hand of Limhi. And this he did because of the great anxiety of his people, for they were desirous beyond measure to know concerning those people who had been destroyed. And this is really interesting. So he translates these plates, the plates of ether. In the Book of Mormon, we have almost the Book of Mormon to the people who are from the Book of Mormon. This idea of the story from previous biblical time that are led out of the wickedness of that time and place and are brought to America and all the things that happened to them and how they are then ultimately destroyed and the plates are hit up. That is a story of the Book of Mormon within the Book of Mormon. Verse 20. And now, as I said unto you, that after King Mosiah had done these things, he took the plates of brass and all the things which he had kept and conferred them upon Alma, who was the son of Alma, yea, all the records and also the interpreters, and conferred them upon him and commanded him that he should keep and preserve them, and also keep a record of the people handing them down from one generation to another, even as they had been handed down from time that Lehi left Jerusalem. And again, I remind you of a man who was one of the vilest of sinners, who then becomes a prophet and is entrusted with all the records and all the relics of the Nephite nation and to lead the church forward, which gives us all great hope. I think so often in the church, even today, we think of the atonement of Jesus Christ for the sinners. But I think we forget it's for the saints as well. It's for those of us who every week go to church, partake of the sacrament, and complete the cycle. We have faith in Christ. We repent. We renew our baptismal covenant. We have an increase of the Spirit, and we move forward. And as we continue to try to become more Christ-like, we have to realize that the atonement is there to give us additional power, to give us the grace, the enabling power to become more and more like Jesus Christ. Well, that concludes our reading for today. I look forward to next week. Have a great week. Keep on reading.